Hi, everybody. Thanks for waiting a little bit. We're a couple of minutes late there. Um, so thanks for making the Living Carbon Grant webinar today. Um, I'm your host, I'm Nicolai Cooper. I work for Local Land Services on the North Coast, and I'm sitting here today with my colleague Stephen, Stephen Conrad, who is the North Coast Local Land Service Natural Capital Advisor. Um, so we're joining in from sunny Gumbangia country today, based in Coffs Harbour. And I'd just like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the Gumbangia elders, past, present and emerging. And I acknowledge and pay my respects to respective nations from where we're calling in today and to those people joining in who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present in the webinar. So thanks, everybody. Um, so to give a little bit of a background here, so the North Coast Local Land Services, they've partnered with the New South Wales Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water, so the Net Zero Land Team. Um, so the North Coast Local Land Services, we're the on-ground partner for helping to deliver a grant which belongs to the Net Zero Land Team. Um, it's our role to guide and assist land eligible landowners um, through to actually applying for a grant through to the, the state um, Net Zero Land Team Department. So um, the requirements and eligibility for the grant has many components. So this will be the first webinar of three. Um, you'll hear from the presenters today who will cover most of the requirements, but um, over the next six weeks, we will have subsequent webinars that cover in more detail some of the aspects to be eligible for this grant. Um, so there is a chat uh, function in this webinar that will show the Living Carbon grant website. And it also has a form if you have any questions. You can open up the form or you can use this QR code that's on the screen and that will take you to an online form to submit any questions. And of course, you can always ring the North Coast Local Land Services on that phone number and register uh, your question and we can, um, we can return your call. So, um, those links will be in the chat in just a second. I'll put them in the chat in just a second. Oh, okay. Yep. yep. The links are coming into the chat. So, we'll get started with the presenters. So, I'd like to introduce Simon Holloway. So, Simon is the Senior Project Officer for the New South Wales Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment, and Water. So, Simon, uh, technically, um, his team will be assessing these, these grants. Um, so take it away, Simon. Thanks, Nikki. I'm just going to share the screen if you can confirm. Yep, I can see your screen there. You might want to put it in the presentation mode. Yep. OK, uh, today I'm going to give a brief presentation about the Living Carbon Grants. Uh, this presentation is aimed specifically at landholders in the North Coast region who may be interested in, in applying for a grant. Um, but there's also a more detailed and longer presentation about the grants more generally that's been recorded by my manager, Jen Hearn, and that's available on the Living Carbon Grants website, along with a lot of other documentation about the grants. So um, I won't repeat the acknowledgement of country, but I'll just say that today I'm presenting from Ngunnawal land. Today I'm going to talk briefly about the Primary Industries Productivity and Abatement Program that is providing the funding for the Living Carbon Grants. Then I'll give you some basic information about the grants themselves, including the eligibility criteria to help you decide whether you can apply and the basic application process. This presentation is not comprehensive, um, but if it looks like something you're interested in, then you should read the grant guidelines and talk to Nikki or John at North Coast LLS. Uh, first, the Primary Industries Productivity and Abatement Program. Um, just a little bit of background. The New South Wales government has a net zero commitment and we have a net zero plan stage one to guide us to achieve our first milestone of a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. 
One of the sectors being targeted is agriculture and land use. So this is being done through the PIPAP, the Primary Industries Productivity and Abatement Program, which is investing $105 million to support carbon actions in that sector. The program has two key, action, sorry, two key actions that are relevant to today's presentation. One is capacity building, and we're supporting the North Coast LLS to employ two part-time carbon officers who will help build the capacity of farmers and other land managers in the North Coast region to do carbon farming. The second key action is to support priority projects. We've developed the Living Carbon Grants to help landholders to create their own tree planting project that will earn carbon credits and also demonstrate the extra benefits of improving biodiversity. So now to the Living Carbon Grants. There are five main outcomes that we want to achieve from these grants. One, we want lots of trees being planted that will absorb greenhouse gases and at the same time improve biodiversity. In particular, that there are certain native plant and animal species and even whole ecosystems that are currently threatened with extinction, and these tree planting projects can help. Uh, two, we want to prove that your carbon credits are worth more with these biodiversity co-benefits added on. So if you sell your carbon credits, we expect you'll get a higher price per tonne of carbon than other carbon projects. Or if you want to keep your credits to offset your own emissions, then you can promote your low or zero emissions products or services but you can also talk about how you're improving biodiversity. Three, we want to improve the knowledge of staff at North Coast LLS and through them to help educate the land managers across their region in carbon management. Four, we want to help landholders to start a medium to large scale carbon tree planting project that can require quite a lot of resources and upfront investment. And lastly, we want, to, we want you as the grantee to demonstrate your project and share the story of your experience to help other people decide whether they're ready to go into carbon farming. So there is a total of $5 million available across three regions with $2 million of that allocated to the North Coast region. Now, if you're eligible, you can apply for between 50,000 and 200,000 in grant funds to help establish your environmental planting project. We also expect you to contribute funds as well. And if you are getting money from someone else to help with the planting, such as from another government program, then you'll have to explain where that funding is coming from in your budget, and that may affect how much you can receive from our grant. So what will a grant fund? Living Carbon Grants will fund specific eligible expenses that are listed here. In simple terms, these are activities that are relatively easy to plan and get quotes for. So the grants can pay up to the full cost of direct seeding or ripping and planting tube stock and tree guards. The grants can fund up to 50% of fencing costs for a standard stock fence and up to 50% of the total grant amount for fencing. Every grant will include a fixed amount of $5,000 to help with admin expenses associated with the carbon project and the environmental accounting that you'll be required to do. Now, just want to note that the, we do require a minimum of 10 hectares to be planted under the grants because this grant is about supporting and demonstrating medium to large scale plantings. So this is also a list here of uh, what the grant will not fund. Um, now, if these are relevant to your planting project, they'll need to be funded through co-contributions or for third party contributions when you develop your project budget. This list isn't exhaustive. Um, there is more detail in section 2.82 of the Living Carbon Grants guidelines. So if you're interested, are you eligible to apply? You must do the project on land in one of the three regions where we have on-ground support, which includes the North Coast. You must have already registered your environmental planting pilot carbon project, and I'll talk more about that process in a minute. You must own the land or be an Aboriginal organisation that has a legal right to the land. And under that simplified environmental planting method, the project must be registered in your name, not of that of a carbon service provider or an aggregator. We'll also potentially fund a few projects on public land, particularly if it's suitable to set up as a permanent demonstration site, but we need to agree on a proposal before the application is made. So the Australian government runs the ACU scheme. That's the Australian Carbon Credit Unit Scheme, which is administered by the Clean Energy Regulator. Now, Katie will be talking a bit more about that in the next presentation, but I just want to run through a few parts that are relevant to these grants. It's one of the easiest, sorry, one of the easiest carbon project methods to understand is environmental plantings. 
This involves planting a mix of local trees and shrubs on land that was previously cleared, and as they grow, they absorb carbon dioxide. It's a method that can be applied fairly broadly to most farmland and also public and Aboriginal managed land. It uses a model called FullCam to calculate the rate of carbon storage as the plants grow. Now, there's also a simplified subset of that method called the environmental planting pilot method. Now, landholders should be able to develop and run a project under this method themselves with a bit of support. It's set up for relatively small plantings up to 200 hectares and external audits are not required. The Clean Energy Regulator who administers the carbon projects also provides phone support. And so this is the method that we chose for our first round of the priority project grants. Now, I'm just going to note that this method is about to be updated and Katie will explain that in her presentation. But what you'll read in the uh, documentation about the grants, it talks about the environmental planting pilot method is the only method you can use. But we will update that when the new method name comes in a couple of months time. So um, we also want you to demonstrate biodiversity improvements and you will need to establish an environmental account. So biodiversity marks are only just starting up and we're still waiting for the natural, sorry, the national nature repair market that will also be administered by the clean energy regulator. But meanwhile, we've chosen accounting for nature as the best option to establish your baseline monitoring. This is an Australian not-for-profit organisation that provides a well-established environmental accounting framework. You can choose which environmental asset you want to monitor, such as the forest you've planted or the koalas or birds that start using those trees as they grow. And there are simple methods that you can potentially do yourself if you don't want to pay experts to assess at a higher accuracy level. So if, you're, if you get a Living Carbon grant, you'll need to register your baseline environmental account with the Accounting for Nature. And your local carbon officer can help you do with that. And Accounting for Nature also provides phone support. So if you're interested and eligible for the Living Carbon grants, what's the application process? So there are certain things you'll need to do. First, design a planting plan using the planting plan template that we provide on the website. Your planting plan must also be endorsed by the North Coast LLS as meeting the regional guidelines and being appropriate for your property. So it's a good idea to involve them from the start. You'll need to register your carbon project with a clean energy regulator and you'll need to fill in the grant application form online using our Smarty Grants website. Once you submit your application, we'll assess whether your project meets the grant criteria, and if your application is successful, you'll be offered a funding deed. So at that point, what do you need to do to complete your project? If you accept and sign the funding deed, you've got 18 months to finish your project. So we're expecting projects to be ready to go. There is a summary here of the activities that you'll need to complete, such as setting up your environmental monitoring and completing the planting and helping to create a case study for your project. But see the guidelines for the more details on that. So if you're interested, uh, there was a, should be a link being put into the uh, chat for the grants website. Otherwise, just search Living Carbon Grants. Uh, the website currently has a lot of general information about the grants, such as the grant guidelines and the frequently asked questions in the top list here. There's also two things that are specific to the North Coast region. We hope to have them go live on the website today, but unfortunately, whoops, excuse me, go back one. Unfortunately, they won't be available online till next Wednesday. Um, so those two things are the North Coast Planting Plan Guide that John will be talking about later in this webinar and the North Coast grant application form where you go to start your application. So apart from the uh, grants website, um, contact your North Coast Carbon Officers, Nikki and John, um, and I believe there'll be information provided at the end of the webinar on how to do that. Uh, so thank you for the time. Um, if there's anything else you want to know about what we're doing in the carbon farming across New South Wales, then you can register to get updates from the Net Zero Land team. The website link is here, www.energynewsouthwales.gov.au slash net zero land. Um, you can also email us directly on the email address shown here, uh, or you can find a link to that on the website. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. So next, then our next speaker is Katie Dugdale. Um, Katie is the Assistant Director the Emissions Reduction Division of the Federal Department of Climate Change, Environment, Energy and Water. So Katie works in the Carbon Crediting Branch 
and Katie's been working on the development of the 2024 reforestation by environmental O'Malley plantings method. So thanks, Katie. Thanks, Nikki. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm also presenting today from Ngunnawal country in Canberra, which is where I grew up. So today I'll give an overview of the general ACU scheme and then I'll talk more specifically as well about the environmental plantings method. So I'll start with a broader overview of the ACU scheme as a whole. Um, I'll talk through the offset integrity standards that are key for the scheme, which might help you contextualise the environmental plantings method a bit more. And I'll talk about some general ACU scheme principles, including briefly touching on the ACU scheme reforms that are currently going on. So there are six offset integrity standards that are written into the legislation. Um, and then the way methods get made, the Emissions Reductions Assurance Committee, who's kind of like hosted by our department, but they are an independent committee. They have to sign off new methods, including this environmental plantings method that's about to be made. They have to sign it off against all of these six standards before the minister will be allowed to sign it and make it. So the first standard is that abatement has to be additional. So additional in this context means that it would not have happened anyway. So that carbon was only sequestered because of the ACU scheme. And this means that projects have to be new. So they can't have already happened and then be credited in retrospect because that wouldn't be additional since it already happened without the ACU scheme. So additionality is a key concept of all ACU projects. Projects have to be measured and verifiable, so it can be proved such as in an audit, for example, that the project has indeed sequestered the carbon it's being credited for. They have to generate eligible abatement. Um, that means abatement that can count towards Australia's international emissions reduction targets, and they have to be evidence-based, which I guess for the environmental plantings method is pretty straightforward because there's a lot of evidence that planting trees and then growing them does in fact sink carbon. Um, you have to deduct all emissions that are a result of the project and estimates about how much abatement you get credited for have to be conservative. So as an example, conservative would mean that if you abate approximately 100 tonnes, somewhere between 95 and 105, then you'd get credited conservatively on the 95 tonne figure. Um, so all of the methods have to take conservativeness into account and they're all designed to credit um, on the lower side, and that's written into the legislation. So generally how the ACU scheme works right now is that the department, like my team, develops methods. However, as part of the ACU scheme reforms that are happening at the moment, the method development process is moving to a proponent-led process where proponents will actually develop methods and put them to the department instead of the department developing the methods themselves. And we already have an uh, interim kind of process in place for this. So we've already received some method ideas from proponents already that are being assessed. Um, once a method has been made, then the clean energy regulator regulates and administers them, but they don't make the policy decisions on them. So I guess that makes sense to have that separation because the people writing the rules like us shouldn't necessarily be the same ones enforcing them, which is what the regulator does. Um, all of the projects under the ACU scheme have to be audited to confirm that they're working. And in the case of vegetation methods, the crediting periods go for 25 years. But then you're also obliged to maintain that carbon pool even after the project finishes, even after you're not getting credits anymore, which is called the permanence period. So that permanence period is either 25 years or 100 years, depending on what you choose for your own project. And then you or anyone who takes over that land will be obligated to make sure that carbon doesn't go back into the atmosphere during the permanence period. Um, so if it burns down or it dies, then you'd have to try to grow it back to what it was. So it's generally meant to be a 100 year permanence period. So after your 25 years, you keep it again for another 100 years, just maintaining it. But there is the option to choose the 25 years, but um, you get a bit less accus over the whole crediting period if you do choose the 25 year option. So I'll get a bit more specifically into the environmental plantings method and the remake of it for 2024. 
So the reason that we're remaking the reforestation by environmental and mallee plantings method is simply because the current one is about to expire. So the carbon crediting methods only last for 10 years and then they expire. And in this case, we're remaking the method pretty much as it is currently. A few changes being made to update it and hopefully make it a little bit easier to participate in some admin changes and stuff. Um, and the remake of this method is a priority for the government. So in terms of timelines, um, we started the remake of this method in March and we managed to get an exposure draft out to public consultation in June, which you can have a look at if you're interested, it's on the um, DQ website. Um, consultation's closed now and I'm working on this now every day to revise the draft. On the 30th of September, the current method will expire. We probably won't have the new method quite ready by then, but it is coming. So we're aiming to just have a really short gap. Um, so it's booked in now for the Emissions Assurance Reductions Committee um, to assess it in October, like against those standards that I was talking about. And then the minister will sign it hopefully shortly after that. So we'll go into some of the eligibility requirements and you'll see that concept of additionality comes up there again. Um, and I'll talk about some of the reporting obligations then quickly touch on how you can apply. So if you have a piece of land that's been clear of forest for at least five years, has never been cleared illegally, doesn't currently have woody biomass on it and it's land that you're allowed to plant on, and it's at least 0.2 hectares, um, you'd probably be able to do an environmental plantings project on it. Although as Simon was saying, if you wanted to get a living carbon grant, it might have to be slightly bigger than 0.2 hectares. Um, but maybe generally something that looks a little bit like this photo here, for example. And if you're planting on an area that does have woody weeds on it, depending what weed species that is, you might be allowed to clear that to make way for a project. Um, and there's a piece in the legislation that explains which woody weeds are allowed to be cleared. So you'd have to know that before you went and cleared it. Um, and the eligible, the eligible land is proposed to be the same in the 2024 method. Like if you look at the exposure draft for that, you'll see that it's the same as the current method. Um, so I was explaining before about how projects have to be additional, so they can't have already started and join the ACU scheme retrospectively. But then what does already started mean? So some methods have allowances to say, okay, you can do some activities before becoming registered and we'll accept that your project is still clearly related to being part of the ACU scheme and we'll still consider it a new project. So it's proposed for the 2024 method in the exposure draft that you'd be allowed, for example, to own seeds and seedlings already. Um, so buying seeds beforehand wouldn't count as starting the project. And it's proposed that you could prepare the land for planting after you apply to register, but before your registration is accepted. Um, but I will just note, this is not signed off yet. So maybe don't go and buy seed stock yet because these allowances haven't been signed off and they could change. That's what we're thinking. Um, so we'll move on to some of the reporting obligations. So in the environmental plantings method, both the current one and in the proposed new one, you would use FullCam to estimate how much carbon your project sequesters. And you can download FullCam before you even start and check it out. You can download it from the department's website. Um, this is an example of a graph that's showing like abatement over time. Um, and you can click some toggles on and off and it kind of shows you like CO2. NO2 abatement and everything. Um, so it's a good way to check out how many credits you might be able to earn. And it can be a little bit tricky to get going with full cam, but there's step-by-step -step guides that you can follow. They show you exactly which button to click. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of help available as well if you wanted to check it out. So for your reporting obligations, you do have to keep records throughout the project. You can check the method determination to know exactly which records to keep. Um, they include things like keeping track of your emissions related to the project and that sort of thing. To get ACUs, you have to submit an offsets report. 
um, about your project to the clean energy regulator. That will include like your full cam modeling to show how much abatement you should earn. Um, and you do that every six months to five years. And then the clean energy regulator would pay credit into your ANRU account, which stands for Australian National Registry of Emissions Units. Um, so you can set that up. It's kind of like a bank account for credits and you just set that up before your first report. When your project registration gets accepted, the clean energy regulator will send you an audit schedule. So under the normal way, if you're not in the pilot, under the normal way, you would have to engage an auditor um, and pay them to come and do audits for your projects. But if you're part of the alternate assurances pilot that Simon was talking about, um, then the regulator can check on your project remotely with imagery instead. And I often get asked if the alternative assurance pilot will continue under the 2024 method. So um, the board of the clean energy regulator will agree whether or not to make the same or a similar pilot that will apply to the new 2024 method. And they'll do that after the new method has been released. So unfortunately I can't give um, too much certainty about whether or not the board of the clean energy regulator will decide that. Um, but all I can say is they will decide that after the new method comes out and it'll be like an attachment to the method. It won't be like written into the method for that pilot. So to wrap it up, if you're going to run a project, maybe after the new method comes out at this stage, um, your first step would be, of course, to talk to your local land services agency. Um, and then the first kind of official step is going to the clean energy regulators apply to participate page, which is just shown here. Um, and you can go through that online services portal. You'll firstly register yourself as a participant. You have to provide your ID, etc. Um, and then you would register your project. And once your project registration is accepted by the clean energy regulator, then you can start it and open your ANRU account where your ACUs will eventually be paid into. Um, so thanks everyone. Um, I've put our team's email address up here. So if you do wanna sign up to updates about the new method, um, you can just let us know that you'd like to be added to the list by emailing acumethods at DQ. Gov.au. Well, thanks, Katie. Thanks for that level of detail there, the overview of the new method that's due to come out in October. Um, so next, then our next speaker is John Nagel. So John and I are working together as the on-ground partner in this in this Living Carbon grant. Um, so John is a senior local land service officer based at Wamba for the North Coast LLS. And John has extensive knowledge of revegetation planning and establishment, and it's gained from four decades of experience in the North East and New South Wales. So thanks, John. Great, thank you, Nikki. And thanks, Simon, for that um, uh, detail on the Living Carbon Grants. Uh, and Katie also for the Clean Energy Regulator's uh, role in this uh, grant process. So local land services, North Coast Local Land Services, uh, myself and Nikki Cooper, um, as well as uh, Steve Conrad and another Stephen, are, um, are a team uh, to support the Living Carbon Grants and also more broadly what's uh, happening in the sort of carbon project environmental market space, um, which is uh, wide, varied and can be uh, uh, complex. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, two important um, documents that Simon outlined. This is the planting plan guideline and the planting plan itself. So the planting plan is what landholders need to uh, produce and for local land services to uh, uh, endorse those plans, and those plans are uh, central to uh, the registration process, and uh, but firstly to the application process under the Living Carbon Grants, and also through the registration process. They also the plans will also flag some of the uh, co-benefits or environmental benefits, uh, including cultural benefits as well for projects on Indigenous land. Um, so 
the the plan <coughs> excuse me is central to uh, our support to landholders for landholders to start um, their plans um, and for us to support that planning process that it may involve also uh, a site visit and discussion. The guideline sets out, the planting plan guideline sets out some North Coast uh, regional specifications. And as you've heard, the, the minimum hectares required for living carbon grants is 10 hectares. You have to have 10 hectares or more of cleared land to uh, undertake uh, environmental plantings. So the plantings need to be uh, a, a replication of the vegetation that occurred on the site. And many of our plant communities uh, on the North Coast are quite diverse. You may find in excess of eight canopy species and uh, in excess of six uh, mid-storey or understory plants. So this is what these plantings are about, the design of them, that they include canopy, sub-canopy, um, mid-layer or mid-storey, uh, some shrub layer and even maybe ground layer species. But the focus will be on the woody um, species, a minimum of eight canopy species and six shrub species. Now, some plant communities may have more than those or less, but that's uh, a, a, a general. The planting uh, densities, we have set a minimum of 800 uh, trees per hectare, which is approximately about three to four metre spacing. So this is fairly... Close spacing. Now, this is required for our subtropical north coast because we want to establish uh, canopy quickly uh, and layers, the canopy layer and the mid-storey layer, and that will capture the site under a, um, a forest structure. I do have some slides and I'll go in through some of the uh, site preparation, uh, planting methods and, and tree protection methods uh, in a short while. Um, the other regional uh, specification is that we will be planting uh, tube stock, so seedlings. There, there won't be direct seeding undertaken. Uh, there's not good example or uh, uh, success with direct seeding on the north coast. Any bare ground doesn't stay bare for very long. Lots of uh, soft weeds, so even woody weeds will emerge from bare soil and outcompete any seed that's broadcast and hoping for germination of uh, seedlings. So it's tube stock. Uh, these might also include what's known as hyco, which are small tubes in a, in a, in a cell. Um, so tube stock or hyco plantings. And the other important thing is that the seedlings planted are propagated from seed um, collected um, within the region and, and potentially within 200 kilometres <clears throat> north or south of um, the planting site. <clears throat> so LLS has got uh, a raft and extensive knowledge, ecological and technical skills uh, to assist landholders. Um, we're aiming for success. Uh, we, we want the plantings um, to not just absorb carbon from the atmosphere, but also provide an environmental benefits to replicate some of the threatened ecological communities that we have, and also support some iconic and threatened um, species. And as I said before, there may be um, plant species of cultural importance as food, food or fibre or medicines for uh, First Nations groups. I'll jump into my... Um, uh, slide presentation now. Okay, let's hope that you've seen that first slide. Thumbs up, I see, thank you. Okay, so uh, first aspect that landholder um, in putting their uh, plan together, their planting plan. Um, oh, we're on a time here. Maybe I'll just uh, go back. So we, we need to work out what species are going to be, uh, what, top, what type of forest is required on the site. You know, what's, what's the structure of it? Is it a wetlands community, you know, paper bark? 
Uh, is it a eucalypt forest, you know, that sort of wet or dry sclerophyll? Um, is it a, a riparian or riverbank uh, uh, planting? Is it a, a rainforest site? Uh, so these are some of the plant communities that we wish to establish. Uh, what species are present either nearby? A bit of prediction about um, what is not there <laughs> uh, and include those. Uh, so we, as I said, we're wanting to replicate the plant communities that were uh, um, on the site. And this is also important of what the constraints are, particularly things like uh, flood, heavy frosting, um, what's the access like, um, and are the soils uh, much depleted or infertile. In planting design, uh, block plantings are better than narrow strips, so we're looking for a 10 hectare uh, plantings. Uh, so the shape and location, if the plantings are adjoining existing vegetation or other in, environmental um, uh, assets such as uh, you know, river systems or wetlands or um, you know, other important habitat features. The species composition is important, particularly to inform uh, and provide habitat value. And again, if there's a species of cultural uh, value and importance. So what are we planting in rows or in clumps? Well, it's going to depend a lot on the site. Because these are large plantings, it's going to lend itself to rows. Um, and those rows might be three and a half, four metres uh, apart. So that implements such as um, tractor slashing can help with maintenance. Or there may be some clump planting elements, particularly along riparian areas, or to capture uh, paddy trees or, or uh, remnant um, clumps of vegetation for them to be uh, incorporated. Um, so the structure is important, as I say, we're not just planting trees anymore, large trees. There's uh, whole layers of our forest, the canopy, the mid-layer shrubs, and they may include some ground covers. I think I've jumped ahead there. That's okay. Um, habitat plantings, we may have a focus, of course, on our iconic uh, koala, uh, eucalypt trees, uh, the um, food plants, of course. Um, over time, there might be opportunity to add uh, habitat features, um, such as logs, rocks, and other things, or the plantings that are again near water bodies, lakes and creeks and swamps. These, these will add the um, habitat features to the, uh, the planting. Important that we're planting local species, so we're addressing this provenance issue. Um, we have seed collecting underway and we hope to continue with seed collecting with our participating landholders. And we have a seed bank that um, we're uh, partnering with the Botanic Gardens in Coffs Harbour and also working with uh, regional land care. We're uh, collecting seed from the region and storing that there for use in this project and, and other uh, environmental projects as well. Now, what, one of the... Uh, important, um, some of the important tools you can work through to find out what plant communities are on site there. There's some um, the um, share and enabling environmental data or the seed site. And this is uh, replicated in an app that's known as Trees Near Me. So you can search what vegetation communities you have on your property or nearby on, on similar, similar soils. And of course, local land services can provide some good advice there. Plant what will grow, of course. Um, and what we're starting is uh, the beginnings of a forest with those of six or eight canopy species or uh, six shrub species. It's just the beginning. And so we're wishing for successional processes. So over time, there's long time frames associated here, 25 years or 100 years. So we almost want the planted forest to um, look like and become natural forest over those time frames. So it's important that successional processes are kick-started with uh, these plantings. Weed control is going to be crucial to success, particularly in the subtropical environment here, not just soft weeds, but many woody weeds, camphor laurel, privet, lantana, and the list goes on. Uh, some sites might be highly degraded, uh, on a floodplain, not much remnant vegetation nearby, so there will be um, the need to use uh, less species or these hardy pioneer species. Getting there. Timeline. Uh, on your uh, planting plan, 
we were asked to um, step out uh, the, um, the planning process uh, up to implementation. Here's some very uh, quick uh, ideas of timelines around uh, securing your uh, plant stock, engaging contractors, um, getting uh, nursery stock um, ordered and set aside, nursery stock hardened, site prepared, um, but that's saw within herbicide application, and making sure you've got your equipment and labour on hand. Here's a little quick one here of the uh, tube and the uh, Heiko cells. Uh, so this is what we'll be planting. Um, those tubes are about 120 millimetres in height, and uh, the Heikos are around about 90. So we hope to be able to use these tubes in, in uh, perhaps mechanical planting or after a site's been um, uh, ripped, that the planting process is um, uh, easier, quicker, uh, less costly by planting into rip lines. Where we can't rip with steeper slopes or areas that are um, sensitive, such as riverbanks, we would um, be auguring um, those holes, uh, spot spraying and, and auguring uh, those, those areas. But of course, uh, weed control is essential, particularly prior to planting, um, mostly sort of chemical uh, use, use of herbicides, or it could in, involve um, you know, slashing uh, or even blading. Tree guards um, can be important for a range of reasons, particularly on frosty sites uh, and or where you've got um, herbivores. Uh, the areas will need to be fenced, though so I'm not talking about livestock, I'm talking about native herbivores, kangaroos and wallabies. So tree, tree guards may be essential uh, on some sites. And here's a range of guards. I think we've moved away from the milk carton there on the far right um, and migrating towards some of these um, flasher uh, biodegradable uh, um, cardboard um, tree guards there on the left side. A couple more slides. Mulch is essential. Um, weed suppression, retaining moisture, um, marking where the plants are, keeping um, soft weeds um, back uh, from plantings. Uh, typically, it's uh, bales of straw, but with our row plantings, um, if there's standing uh, grass or biomass there, we're looking at slashing that material into the planting row. Um, we've been rowing it back into the planting row. So, um, we want to explore that, and uh, landowners have got skills and knowledge in that area um, we'll be chatting to you. Importantly, maintenance is uh, required, and this is something a landholder has to uh, uh, take on board, that the, uh, the um, living carbon grants uh, won't pay for the ongoing uh, maintenance. So there's a whole raft of things there, not just losing plants uh, and weed control, but pests and diseases, a photo there of myrtle rust affecting some of our um, rotaceae species in the region. Um, and also uh, repair work after uh, impacts, particularly after, say, flooding or uh, drought, um, heavy frost that um, protected. Now, access tracks are also really important to allow this maintenance. So access tracks need to be built into the design of the planting. I think of this as the last one. Monitoring, of course. Uh, we've heard that monitoring is required for the uh, clean energy regulation process. It's also... Um, part of the uh, Accounting for Nature um, uh, registration as well. So very simply, uh, before and after photos, but um, there'll, be, there'll be other sort of monitoring uh, methods that will be able to support landholders to undertake. I think that's about me done. I'll stop sharing. And back to Nikki in the studio. Thanks, John. That that four decades of experience really shines through. Thank you. <laughs> um, so our next speaker has a registered planting project with the Clean Energy Regulator. So we've got Matthew, Matthew Bleakley here, who is the director of Banyala Australia Propri Proprietary Limited. So Matthew's been involved with the development of Banyala farm at Clune since 2015. Um, Matt, I seem to have lost you from my screen. I guess you're, I'm I guess here, you're I'm here. 
Oh, you are there. Oh, good. It's just, oh, here we, here I can see you now. Okay, thank you. Um, so Matt's been, as I said, he's been involved in the development of Banyala at based at Kloon since 2015. So Banyala started as a small macadamia farm and it's now grown into a 900 acre regenerative agriculture operation with bush foods, beef cattle and carbon farming. And over the past three years, Matthew's been transitioning from his job as an accountant and he's now working to develop the larger vision of Daniela. So thanks, Matt. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for taking the time to come to the seminar. Uh, I will probably try to talk to the practical examples that uh, previous speakers uh, have talked about rather than maybe some of the, the detail uh, because uh, we're two years into our, our project now. We registered in June of 2022 with the with the regulator and started planting in August 22. So we expect to get our first accus in around the end of this year um, to give people an idea of the size of our plantings. We have a big scrub sort of remnant restoration planting area of 55 hectares and a koala friendly habitat planting of 25 hectares. So um, the overall vision, I suppose, of Banyula was to integrate the plantings into our landscape. And I think it's probably one of the more important messages um, we'd like to say be able to spread in that uh, no matter whether you're on 900 acres or 90 acres, uh, taking that time to look at your landscape and, and the land that you have and understanding the different soil types and and the different areas like riparian areas if you have them and, and understanding how they can fit into your picture. We spent at least 18 months doing that um, and we had to kind of do it a little bit solo. Uh, I think this grant and the opportunity to work with LLS and have people with John's 40 years of experience to help with the farm management plan is uh, something I certainly wish we had in the beginning because it's um, it's gold. To be able to have someone who can help and let you understand your land and, and help you make a farm plan, uh, I, I think is an exceptional opportunity and, and certainly helps shortcut of things. As uh, I said before, we run uh, macadamias, Davis plums, fingerlong, the bush foods, and we have beef cattle. And our goal was to incorporate these into the land. The benefits that we saw was better use of our non-productive areas. We had a lot of steep gullies, degraded land that required a lot of maintenance and was not productive at all and was either going to be in, infested with camphor or was you know, well on its way to being severely eroded. Uh, we saw it as a as an opportunity to do something else with that land, actually earn carbon credits and end up with a better biodiversity outcome. Uh, the koala friendly carbon project that, that we did, uh, we certainly believe that's uh, absolutely transformed an area we're two years into there. Prior to that, we were spending a lot of, on um, herbicide, basically trying to manage steep steep terrain, inaccessible cattle were doing a lot of damage in there. Um, we haven't actually spent a cent on anything other than putting the trees in and the maintenance on them now, and we can already see the transition of that, that land, and we actually already have koalas turning up in the neighbourhood and we don't expect it to be too long until they jump the fence and head over next door to us. Uh, we, we also have a bit of a vision of the rainforest planting that we've done, uh, contributing to the local biodiversity of the area and the flow on effects to our farm uh, in protecting our waterways. Uh, prior to that, our waterways were all accessible by the cattle and there was some fairly um, severe erosion. We've got eight kilometres of Wilson River frontage and 
Uh, there were some really bad areas. We've fenced that off. Cattle no longer can get in there and planted all along the riparian area. We've been through a massive flood already. And even when the plantings are, you know, were quite young, uh, they did their job. And uh, the areas that had previously eroded quite severely in prior floods, they were still affected because our trees were younger, but they were certainly less affected. Um, we look forward to a time in the future when yeah, the land is much more resilient. One of the reasons we got into the carbon project as well is because as an accountant, as um, I think Nikki introduced me, we kind of run our numbers. We ran them conservatively and just to be able to share a bit of those numbers with, with people and, you know, disclaimer, they're relevant to our property and they may not be relevant to everybody's, but to share that example, across our plantings, we expect to get somewhere between 55,000 and 65,000 ACUs. And if I if I looked at the price today, around forty dollars or something like that, it would generally be about cost recovery on everything that we've done. So, uh, but we also see it as a say insurance against potential future requirements by um, regulators to control or be responsible for our own emissions, and so we see it as a an insurance policy for that as well. Uh, we have land, uh, like I said, steep gullies. We have frost. Um, John's attested to maintenance. Uh, I probably did want to talk a bit about the maintenance requirements because that's where we are now. We're, we're knee deep in maintenance. Um, planting preparation was really important, as um, John advised. We tried very different methods. We spot sprayed, we blanket sprayed, we uh, did no, we did weed matting, we've done mulching, we probably tried tried them all. Um, I'd it's beyond the scope of this maybe seminar to tell you what worked in all those areas, what do it didn't. I think it's about going out there, getting some advice and really understanding your, your, your land. I can attest to a lot of what John said in terms of getting pioneers established first, understanding your frost requirements. We do have very frosty flats down on our property and we did have some losses and we had to commit to replacements. We tried some different strategies, some worked, some didn't. But really understanding the maintenance requirements of what you're putting in and the commitment to it, particularly in the first three years and understanding that, that cost, whether you do it yourself or you contract it out. We do contract it out with a small amount of internal staff as well. Uh, I think that's, that's yeah, really, really important. We do have maintenance tracks through there, and I think that's an, uh, a must for us. Um, I would certainly suggest that. When we talk the, the co-benefits, I can tell you from a real live example that we are getting approached already for to for you know forward sell our accus because of our co-benefits. We are already being offered a premium. We're not in a position to sell, or we're not looking to, but we already are being offered a premium for our, our co-benefits on our accus if we wanted to forward sell them. Uh, that's probably about it for me. Well, I think I'm probably up out of time anyway, and um, Stephen's going to wrap it up. But I hope that gave you a little bit of an insight into the real world of uh, carbon planting. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much, Matt. That was great real real life example. Um, so, I guess where we're at now we're nearly at one hour so we'll just recap um that there are some key contacts here um so they're just coming up on the screen now and really um the key contact will be the clean energy regulator and these are for any questions in relation to registering a project with the Clean Energy Regulator. Obviously, John Nagel and myself uh, are available to talk about the grant and the planting plan. Um, we have um, 
we can put you in touch with Simon Holloway's team also if necessary. Um, and here at the North Coast, I've mentioned before that Stephen Conrad is sitting in with me. He's the Natural Capital Advisory. Um, he has that role here at North Coast Local Land Service. So if you're looking at your property scale and what opportunities may be coming up in the future or just getting to learn learn some of the lingo that's involved. Um, Stephen's looking at running some programs like that for our customers in the not too distant future. So part of today was to present you with our expression of interest form, which is opening up today. So again, we've got a QR code here on the screen. Um, you can either use that with your mobile phone or in the chat. Um, there should also be... I'll put it in there one second. Oh, yeah. Okay share it and do it so oh right yeah so just coming up in the chat now I'll just give it a bit of a moment if you needed to use that form but either way you can you can contact us and we can send you a link to um, this expression of interest form but Steve's just going to pop the link into the chat now and then um you can click on that link and follow through the the form with a few details if you're interested. I mean, there's a lot lot of information to try and get your head around. So we appreciate that nobody could be certain or not whether they wanted to allocate 10 hectares of more of their property um, by listening to a one hour session. So we're not expecting that. But if you think that it meets your values and your land management vision of, for your property, then it's probably a good idea to express an interest or either just contact John or I and we can talk you through some of the aspects of the project. Um, but as, as mentioned earlier, we will be running two more webinars that cover topics such as the accounting for nature requirement and um, broader natural capital um, opportunities and programs. Um, so I think you can see that link now, the expression of interest form in the chat. So hopefully some of you might be able to open that up and save it um, as a favourite so you can, if you're interested in, in filling those out. But thank you very much for your time today. Thank you to all the speakers and uh, we appreciate you tuning in to listen. So thanks everybody. See you later. <laughs>